Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the AVID protocol, which is a method for assessing vegeta vegetation impacts from deer. Uh, but before I do, I like to talk about how deer affect our woods and some uh, ways that we can, we can kind of detect that visually before we get into an actual monitoring protocol. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the condition of New York's forests. You know, what do they look like? How are they looking today? What's the prognosis? How deer affect our woodlands? And then last, um, what is AVID and how can you get involved? So what makes a healthy forest? And there are many, many elements of a healthy forest, but um, to just kind of sum it up in a nutshell, I'm going to talk about a healthy forest as being one that has a variety of different native uh, plant and tree species. And the ability for a new forest to grow, or the term that you may have heard is regenerate um, in the case of disturbance. So that can be a natural disturbance, like a blowdown or an ice storm, or it can be a uh, timber harvest, which often is um, you know, timber harvest kind of uh, replicate what a natural disturbance would cause. The issue in New York State is that um, you know, regeneration has been kind of difficult in uh, recent decades. Uh, the Nature Conservancy did some modeling in 2010 looking at the predicted regeneration of native tree canopy species in New York State. And uh, in the image that you see in this slide, uh, green means very good uh, predicted regeneration. Um, light green means good. Fair is kind of that orangish tan color and poor is in red. And so overall in the state, 68% of forests had uh, good to very good predicted regeneration, and a third was poor to fair. But what this considered is all native tree canopy species, including American beech, which you may or may not know, is a species that um, deer don't really like to eat. And so beech can kind of take over an area. Um, and so this includes, this uh, image here includes American beech. When they looked at just desirable timber species, so that would be things like maple and ash and oak. And for me, for being a wildlife biologist, I'm not thinking of it in terms of desirable timber species, I'm thinking of it in terms of tree species diversity. And uh, so just general diversity and different kinds of trees that you can grow. Um, but when they looked at those species alone, um, only 43% of our forest stands were predicted to have 40 or good to very good regeneration potential, and over half were poor to fair. And you can see that most of the good regeneration potential um, in this case is really located up in the Adirondacks and areas like the Hudson Valley and the Catskills are looking um, pretty poor. And this kind of parallels um, what um, colleagues of mine in uh, the Department of Natural Resources found in a survey in 2009 where they surveyed foresters and they asked them um, what they were seeing in terms of forest regeneration success. And that would be basically seeing seedlings coming up on the forest floor. Um, are there young trees replacing the mature trees in the canopy? And um, I just wanna kind of direct your attention to the numbers in red uh, where un under the column statewide and statewide they thought 45 percent um, of the stands were marginally successful across the state and 25 percent they considered a complete failure when they were asked you know what they thought were the main causes of failed forest regeneration and they could choose more than one so it's not going to add up to 100 but deer browsing came um, came up as the top uh, top reason, and interfering vegetation um, was second. That was about 50% of the stands. They felt like other vegetation was interfering. And interfering vegetation, I'll show you some pictures um, a little later on, but that could be invasive species or it could be native species that are taking over a stand, kind of um, out-competing others. So DEC's recent deer management plan, which covers the period from 2021 to 2030, um, in that plan, they use a term that um, a colleague of mine from West Virginia, Dave McGill, um, kind of coined in a paper in 2019 called regeneration debt. 
And that's, um, he defined that as the condition that predicts the eventual loss of canopy species when you have a limited abundance of seedlings and saplings um, available on the forest floor to kind of take the place of canopy trees if they were lost or a mismatch in the species composition. So that would be, you know, say you have sugar maple in the canopy, um, but you have nothing but beech on the forest floor in terms of seedlings and saplings. That predicts that the composition of that forest over time is going to change. It's not going to be the same forest in the future. Or there may not be any seedlings at all to replace those canopy trees should a disturbance happen today. Um, so essentially, um, you know, regeneration debt exists when the number of seedlings and saplings isn't adequate to replace um, replace the, the canopy trees. And here's a, uh, a picture, a very a simplified picture of New York State and regeneration debt um, across the state by aggregate wildlife management unit. And you can see here that acceptable regeneration is present generally in the Adirondacks and a little bit of the southern tier there. It's uh, vulnerable. Regeneration is considered vulnerable in a lot of the rest of the state. There's an area that's not acceptable in the Finger Lakes region, and then also down uh, most of the Hudson Valley and Long Island is considered not, not acceptable regeneration being present there. So that's just a more updated modeling um, that was conducted by uh, SUNY ESF as part of um, DEC's uh, moving toward their new management plan. So white-tailed deer are, um, are very interesting because they have the ability to change their own habitat and the habitat of other species. And they do that through um, basically by what they eat and how much they eat. And so how do deer affect the forest? Um, they affect the forest in a number of different ways, but mostly directly by feeding or browsing on tree seedlings and other forest plants. And uh, for example, um, there's this small oak seedling on the left there. It's been browsed. That was um, part of a planting we did. We planted some seedlings, uh, black cherry and red oak, inside and outside of an exclosure. And that that picture of that, uh, that uh, seedling was probably um, 12 years after the planting. Um, inside the exclosure, those seedlings had grown way, well beyond the height that deer could reach. But outside, they were still hanging in there, but they were being browsed repetitively, and they just, they were like little bonsai seedlings. So they kind of uh, are, some seedlings are incredible in their ability to survive, but they're not really going to go anywhere. So direct browsing can, um, you know, can basically prohibit some plants from growing. And through direct browsing, they can also affect the forest structure. So in this picture, there's, you know, plenty of light, looks like getting through the canopy. Uh, so there should be something growing on the forest floor, but there are entire layers of vegetation that are missing. There's no uh, understory coming up. There's no shrub layer. There's very little on the on the forest floor. So a lot. It's just kind of this open park-like stand um, that's missing a lot of of the structure that you might want to see in um, in a healthy forest. All right. So in addition to um, affecting the the number of plants directly and the structure. Um, they can influence the kinds of plants that grow in the forest. I'm sure you've all heard, you know, there that deer have some species that they prefer and others that they don't. And so, you know, when you're planting your own gardens or thinking about landscaping plants, you're out looking for deer resistant plants or um, and so it's the same in the forest. In the forest, we have plants that um, deer prefer, things like maples and ash um, and oaks and aspen, they like hemlock. Birch is one of those things where, and the more papers you read, you know, some are always in the high preference list and some are always in the low preference list and others like birch is one that seems to go back and forth. Um, black cherry also is sometimes on one list and sometimes on the other. Um, and there are some local preferences too. Deer do seem to develop some local preferences, but there are some that are, you know, in general, maples, ash, oak are pretty vulnerable. American beech, hub hornbeam, striped maple are things that, uh, American hornbeam are things that deer tend not to eat or not to eat as many of, I shouldn't say not to eat. And when they say that there are deer resistant plants, they're only resistant until there aren't any other plants to eat and then they're no longer resistant. Okay, 
okay, just to give you a, an illustration, kind of a visual, this slide shows um, a forest stand. So generally, um, you know, the similar composition of the canopy trees, there was a harvest, a thinning conducted. And the only difference between the right side of the slide and the left side of the slide is that deer were fenced out of the right side of the slide. So there was a harvest that occurred at the same time in the entire area, the fence was put up. And what we see here is that on the right, we have this whole understory starting to grow and thrive. There's a diversity of different woody species that are growing up versus the left-hand side where you see grasses and ferns, probably hay-scented fern or New York fern. And you can also see that there is basically no vegetation in the first six feet, other than the fern and grass, up to about six feet um, high. And that's called a, a browse line. It's basically the area that deer can reach. And so um, I notice a lot when I'm driving along New York highways and I look at the edges of a field and I look at the, the woodlands, the woodland and field edge, and you can often see that browse line up to about six feet where you see nothing um, as you peer into the, the woods that you're driving by. Uh, so this happens um, this happens often. And then what, what happens on the left side here, when once you have grass and fern established, it's very difficult for, for seedlings to take hold. So that becomes kind of a perpetual state unless there's some sort of active management that takes place to um, to get rid of the fern and allow for regeneration, which is, you know, difficult and costly, um, costly to do. There have been many, many, many papers um, looking at the effects of deer on a variety of things, on vegetation and on other wildlife. So I've just selected a couple um, to highlight the points that I want to make tonight, but there are, are many out there. So um, one study um, by uh, Nuttall et al. Um, they had some exclosures, or actually enclosures, where they enclosed a certain number of deer into fenced areas for 10 years at different densities of deer. So they just had these, um, you know, enclosures, basically like pens, but they were large pens. Um, and they enclosed a, a known number of deer inside of those, so they knew the number of deer per acre, or in this case, um, it's represented as deer per square mile. And um, then they removed the deer. And this graph is showing the effects on tree diversity 15 years after the deer were removed. And so you can see that on the bottom axis is the number of deer. And on the left is the tree species diversity or the number of trees species. Um, and so where there were a higher uh, density of deer in the en enclosures, um, that lower tree diversity uh, persisted even 15 years later, which you would expect because trees are very long lived. So whatever's happening on the forest floor today, I mean, you know, our trees, our forests might be 100, um, 150 or more years old, most of our secondary forests. And um, so, you imagine that whatever shaped the forest, whatever was happening to those seedlings um, 150 years ago is what affected what trees we have now in our tree canopy. So um, so there's evidence that deer affect the tree composition many years after um, their presence. This is another um, study. This one's uh, really interesting. This is in a 60-year uh, deer exposure. And um, I think it's the, the longest running deer exposure or known deer exposure. And they looked at, uh, this is in Pennsylvania, and they looked at on the left side in the left column, um, it shows the mean percent cover inside the exposure, so where there weren't any deer. And uh, percent cover is just like how much area was covered by that, by that wildflower species. And on the right column is the mean percent cover outside of that deer exposure. And so we can see things like white baneberry, there's a trace of it inside, jack in the pulpit a little bit inside, none outside. Um, let's look at some of the bigger ones. Canada Mayflower, which is depicted, you can see the picture of Canada Mayflower in the lower left corner of the slide. That was 18% and there's only a trace outside. 10% um, fall Solomon seal inside, none observed outside. There was in Indian cucumber root inside, very little outside. 
And then, you know, it goes on and on. Red trillium, 9% inside, less than 1% outside. Um, so altogether, that 42% of the ground was covered with wildflowers inside the exclosure, and only uh, less than 1% was covered by wildflowers outside the exclosure. And that was after excluding deer um, from within, it, you know, in that area for 60 years. So deer also, in a, addition to affecting the tree species that grow somewhere, uh, grow in a given forest, they also affect the, uh, the wildflowers and other native vegetation. They looked at the same thing with, um, with native shrubs. So some of the dogwoods and partridge berry, blackberries, red elderberry, red raspberry, so all the rubuses. And basically there was you know, some cover, maybe sometimes a, a good amount of cover inside the exclosure where deer hadn't been and uh, none observed outside. And then they looked at ferns. And uh, so there was a little bit of rattlesnake fern inside, a little bit of hay-scented fern inside, some intermediate wood fern and some New York fern, um, not much uh, New York fern inside or outside. But if you look, interestingly, the hay-scented fern was more abundant outside of the exposure. And that's because deer tend not to prefer hay-scented fern. They don't eat much of it. And so once you know it gets established very quickly when they're eating other things, um, it kind of gives the fern, the hay-scented fern a competitive advantage. Um, sometimes those grasses too, and then again, they get established, and once they're established, they're very difficult to, um, to get rid of. So the conclusion of that study, um, again, from North Central Pennsylvania, was that deer browsing has caused about a 60 to 80 percent decline in the number of species that they have in that region. Many of the plants um, that they were looking at have low dispersal and reproduction rates, so that, re, that reduced number of species uh, will persist for many, many years. Okay, so in addition to uh, affecting the native species that we have in our forest, um, when deer browse those native plants, um, again, it allows room for things like ferns or uh, for invasive plants to take over. So it's essentially uh, by removing the native vegetation, it's it's creating this opening, this opportunity for invasive species to, to move in. It's kind of a disturbed condition. And so oftentimes you'll have things like garlic mustard or Japanese barberry moving in and uh, creating a degraded, more degraded plant community. And similarly, once you have invasive species, unless you take some sort of active management um, approach to, to get rid of those and to, re, you know, to be able to replace what's on the forest floor with something else, um, then that's usually the, the condition that will persist. And it's not only um, invasive species, um, I mentioned the fern and I show another picture of that here, but also um, American beech is a native species, a tree species that um, because of beech blight, um, they, it's a, a disease that beech trees get. Uh, when they start to die, um, they'll sprout profusely from the root system and create these beech thickets. And as they do, and the, the small beech start to grow, um, deer don't really like to eat them. And so they tend to um, get an advantage over, over other species. And then they form these, uh, what we refer to as kind of beech thickets. Okay, so um, deer affect the vegetation in a forest, they affect the structure, and um, by doing this, they affect other wildlife. So they can change, again, the habitat structure and composition. And if you look at the picture on the left, which is that more, again, the more open park-like type of um, setting versus what's on the right, which is a, a timber harvest where um, there was lots of different vegetation layers, um, you can imagine that this could affect the types, uh, the species of wildlife that are present, and especially when it comes to birds, because birds tend to divide the habitat in a forest vertically. So where you might have oven birds using the forest floor, or have chickadees using the midstory, and maybe scarlet tanagers in the canopy, um, each bird kind of, each species kind of uh, specializes in one layer of vegetation in the forest. So when you remove or are missing uh, multiple layers in the forest, like in the picture on the left, and you only have the canopy, then you're gonna be missing the habitat for those species that, that require that layer of vegetation to be successful. 
And so there's also been um, quite a bit of research looking at the legacy effect that deer browsing has on bird density. Um, here's a, uh, a study from Nettle et al. Uh, where they looked at um, deer density. It was the same one as the, the, I showed the tree species diversity on the left. And this one is uh, for bird density. So this is a number of birds. And um, looking at that compared to the number of deer within the exclosures on, on the bottom there. And so as you can see, as the number of deer in the enclosure um, got higher and higher, the bird density years later, um, once they were removed, was still lower. And again, that's because, um, you know, there's that legacy effect on the trees that are present in the habitat and the structure of the forest. And so even many, many years later, that's going to affect the number of birds and the types of birds that can live there. So um, high deer densities during forest stand initiation, that's the time when seedlings are growing or should be growing to replace the canopy, um, can lead to a decrease in the, the foliage density, so the, the leaf density in a forest, um, and that affects the density of forest insects that are present for food for birds. And so those things kind of in tandem can then decrease bird density. Uh, there's another study from New Jersey looking at forest breeding bird species trends from 1980 to 2005. And they found that generally mid-story shrub and ground nesting birds were decreasing whereas canopy nesters were increasing or stable. And they blamed that largely on deer and deer browsing and that loss of the forest structure that would support things like oven birds, rose-crested rose beaks, and wood thrush, you know, those other layers of vegetation. And deer can also have a, a long lasting effect on their own habitat. So I think um, it's something to keep in mind that if Deer are basically are eating themselves out of house and home as they as they uh, over browse these forests too. So um, less less food available uh, for deer, less food available for other species. Okay, so what what can you do or what can we do um, to help this? Um, there are, there are a number of things. Um, I think the most informative thing is to just do a visual assessment. So basically just go out in the forest and look, whether it be your own property or properties where you're hiking, um, properties in your community. Um, there's a lot of value to just observing when you go out in the forest. Um, you wanna look um, at tree seedlings. Is there direct evidence of browsing like on the seedling that I showed you on the earlier slide? Um, are there spring wildflowers, things like trillium present, and do they flower? So this is something that, that was very um, interesting to me when I started this project. Um, I was used to seeing deer browsing seedlings, and I knew that deer had an impact on native vegetation, but I, I hadn't really been looking closely at wildflowers in the forest. And for AVID, and um, we tried to develop a protocol to... Uh, to monitor seedlings and one to monitor wildflowers. And the wildflower one is, is just not as easy to use and I'll explain why later. But, um, but as part of that, I started going around and, and looking, okay. So I was at our teaching and research forest, the are not teaching and research forest down near Newfield. And I was walking around this one stand and I was seeing a lot of trillium, but these teeny tiny three leaf trilliums, very young, um, small, and then some that were a little bit bigger, but they weren't flowering. And then I happened upon an exposure that somebody had put up probably 25 years before for a different reason. Um, and there were uh, lots and lots of trillium and they were like two feet tall with big showy flowers. I'd never seen anything like it. It was really incredible. We're all in the same stand. And outside of that tiny little exposure, a lot, just a lot of those little guys there. So when a when a wildflower is browsed by a deer, um, it has to put all its energy into into growing the plant, regrowing the plant, and it doesn't have the energy to flower and produce seeds. And for something like trillium, that can take seven years before it even flowers and produces seeds. Um, you know, it can take a long time for for a population to recover. Um, and uh, in the meantime. If it's being browsed and not flowering, there are no seeds going into the soil to create 
future Trillium. So it's really interesting to really take a hard look um, to learn what those, uh, especially Trillium, uh, looks like when it's small and uh, and to, to take a look around. And then think about, um, are there a variety of different tree seedling types present? And are any of them able to grow greater than five feet tall? Are any of them reaching a height where they're escaping deer or are they, are they all very small? Again, at our uh, that same stand where I was looking at Trillium, um, there are, it's a sugar maple stand, lots of sugar maple in the canopy. And there are a lot of sugar maple seedlings on the forest floor but they're all about six inches tall. And so what happens is you get seedlings that seeds fall and the seedlings start to grow. But then uh, in the winter time, deer come along and they browse them off. And so you tend to get about the average, the height of the average snowpack is about the height of the seedlings that you might see for species that deer prefer. Now in a year like this, the average snowpack is not very much. So that's not so great for seedlings, I would say. All right, and then you might want to collect information on your land or whatever land you might be interested in and monitor it over time to see if those conditions are changing. That's another way to know, um, you know what, what's happening to the plant community, what's happening to the forest. So the benefits are that you get an up-close look at your land or whatever land you're, um, is near and dear to you on a yearly basis. And it's a way to know if deer are preventing you from growing or regenerating a new forest. And so as a way to do that, um, myself and Peter Smallage and Paul Curtis in the Department of Natural Resources developed this um, protocol that we call AVID, Assessing Vegetation Impacts from Deer. Um, and we developed it with funding from DEC. DEC was very interested in having on the ground data to show where there were deer impacts and how how much deer were impacting forest regeneration. We we know that there are impacts, but they just didn't have a lot of data. And um, so they um, asked us to try to develop this so that they could have more data to try to um, help them help inform their deer management decisions. So we developed it with uh, landowners and hunters and foresters and land managers and land trust personnel volunteers in mind. Um, we wanted it to be pretty uh, an easy method to use. Um, and basically it includes going out and collecting information about, uh, again, wildflowers, or now we're really emphasizing the tree and shrubs uh, seedlings um, out there on the land. And uh, mostly because wildflowers are, are very difficult. You can't tag them. Um, you can't tag the actual flower, whereas you can tag the actual seedling. And the flowers tend to come up in different, slightly different locations each year. So it just it's a little bit more difficult to do. So uh, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to participate in AVID? We well, might want to learn about the ecology of your own land and learn to identify a few spring wildflower or a few tree seedlings. Um, you might want to develop an eye for recognizing those key signs of deer impacts to, to woodlands. And uh, maybe you would like to contribute to this statewide effort to document the health of New York forests and, and track those changes over time. So um, in a nutshell for AVID, um, we ask that you find and tag 25 to 30 tree seedlings and or wildflowers, but I'm just gonna say tree seedlings from here on out um, and measure them once a year over a three year period. So that would be four measurements total. Um, and that's, basically what AVID is in a nutshell. And the, the 25 to 30 tree seedlings have to all be the same species. So if you're gonna monitor sugar maple, you're gonna tag and measure 25 to 30 sugar maple. If you're gonna monitor ash, it would be 25 to 30 ash seedlings. And you can do more than one species um, at a time. You just need 25 to 30 of each. So uh, the steps to, um, to conducting AVID, uh, the first thing you're going to do is to select a forest stand. So within any given forest, um, you may have several different stands on the property. And so a stand is just something with a distinctly different condition. And you can think of it as something similar to a farm field. So you may have a corn field and a pumpkin field and, or a cabbage field. And so it's the same with forests. You might have a hemlock stand or an oak pine forest 
or northern hardwood. So a stand is just a, an area that's similar in composition. And you can select one stand to monitor, or you can select more than one stand. stand and, um, and then the next thing you want to do is to select a, a site or an area of that stand where you want to actually put your plots in. And so you're looking for an area that basically isn't too steep, because if it's very steep, um, you know, that can limit the amount of deer browsing that's happening. And so it might not be representative of what's happening in the forest overall. You don't want a site that's super rocky because it's really, um, it can be hard to pound your center stake in. And also the rocks will inhibit seedling growth as well. Um, and you wanna avoid areas where ferns and grasses and invasive species cover much of the site because you're not likely um, to have many seedlings growing there anyway. All right, so you just kind of do some reconnaissance. You take a little stroll, you look around in the area that you think you're gonna monitor. Um, you take a look at what seedlings are growing there. You don't have to know your seedlings right off the bat. You just find something that looks the same and is happening over and over and over again. And then you can just narrow it down to identifying that one species. Once you know, well, yes, I'm gonna have 25 to 30 of these, it shouldn't be a problem to monitor this species. Um, and you can, you can kind of just learn one or two that way. And so look at what's the most abundant. I'm finding um, that ash seedlings are probably the most abundant and mature forest. So even though ash has, you know, emerald ash borer, when it's getting older, there are still um, quite a few seedlings on the forest floor. And so ash can still be a, a beneficial species for monitoring. Um, same thing with wildflowers, if you're going to attempt wildflowers. But as I said, the seedling method is easier. Uh, the seasonal timetable, that's another reason that seedlings um, can be better, is that spring wildflowers kind of have a limited amount of time. You know, they come up early and then they kind of senesce oftentimes by um, late June. Some of them, like trillium, will be kind of not at their natural height, kind of falling over. So woody seedlings, though, um, you know, trees or shrubs, you can monitor any time from when, from leaf out until leaf off. So you have um, a big monitoring window there. Um, so late May to um, early October, the beginning of October. So within a given stand, once you go out and you select the site where you're gonna put your plots, um, then we ask that you set up four to six plots and each plot, this is gonna be a round plot, will capture at least five to eight seedlings of the same species. So if you're going for 30, and you can have six plots, then each plot would have five, for example. If you want fewer plots, then you just need to have more seedlings in each plot. The plot centers are gonna be at least 25 feet apart, and that's just so that you're getting a decent amount of representation of the area by kind of moving your, setting your plots a little bit um, apart from one another. Um, and then, then you mark and measure a total of 30 seedlings, as I mentioned before. This is what a plot looks like. We take a stake. Uh, we've been using PVC and just cutting cutting short stakes and spraying the top with orange and then pounding that in as a center stake. So I would go into this area and I before I put my center stake in, I would look around and I would think, okay, within this uh, these plots are um, a six foot radius. So I would look around within six feet of this spot where I want to put my center stake, can I find six seedlings total to tag? And if the answer is yes, I pound in my stake. Then I have four pin flags, you know, the, the little like orange or yellow plastic flags at the end of a metal stem. You can get those at Lowe's or Home Depot. Um, I have four of those. And in each cardinal direction, so north, south, east, and west, I put a flag. A pin flag at the end of six feet. Um, I often use a string with a loop on it that's six feet long. I put the little loop over the center post. I take my compass. I go to north. I walk out six feet. I put my pin flag in. I do the same for each other cardinal direction. And so when I'm done, I have this kind of circular plot marked with four, four flags in each cardinal direction. And um, those different flags are then 
basically breaking the circle into four sections, the Northeast quadrant, the Northwest, the Southwest, and the Southeast. And that's very helpful for relocating your seedlings once you tag them. So next year you go back to measure them again, you wanna know where they are, and it helps you to narrow it down. So I know that seedlings one, two, three, uh, and four are in the Northeast quadrant, seedling six is in the Southwest quadrant. It helps me to relocate them. Not such a big deal if it's a, a mature forest with a kind of a more open understory, but if you're in an area with a recent timber harvest and suddenly there's a flush of growth everywhere, it can be really, really important. So you wanna record a number of different things. We have a site uh, plot data sheet and a site data sheet. You wanna record things like uh, canopy closure. Is the canopy closed or open? Uh, the amount of ground cover, uh, what the dominant species in the forest are. So there are a number of attributes that, uh, that you record. And then you basically tag and measure the height of the seedlings um, that you're gonna monitor within that plot. So we have um, pre-numbered tags. I don't know if that one is in this slide. Uh, the one on this, the yellow um, tag on the left on this little seedling um, is what our tags look like. Only these were, the, this picture shows one where you, you had to hand write the tag number, but we have some that are printed, printed like rolls, literally tens of thousands of these tags. If anybody interested, I can give them to you for free. Um, but they're pre-numbered and so they're very handy and you just kind of, uh, there's a loop, you just kind of slide them in the loop and, and pull them tight. You want to pull it tight enough that they're going to stay on, but you don't want to um, pull it too tight so that it's uh, right up against the stem because that can trap moisture and that can be bad for the seedling. So you want to keep it a little bit loose, but not so loose that it's going to slip off easily. So you basically you tag the seedling and then you measure it. And you measure it from the ground where it's coming out of the ground to the top of the newest woody growth. So in the picture on the right, you can see the newest woody growth at the end of the arrow is at one place. If I was to measure the highest leaf, for example, that would be at another place, but we don't wanna measure the highest leaf because leaves come out at different places and are at different heights each year. So we're doing the, um, the newest woody growth. All right, so we tag them, we measure their height, uh, we want to measure their natural height rather than extending them manually. So if the seedling is kind of arcing over, for example, we want to measure from the base of where the stem's coming out. And I often will take some other device to kind of uh, make it kind of parallel to the ground and then measure up to the, where the top of the woody growth is here. So I don't stand it up and then measure it. I leave it wherever it is. So it's basically kind of measuring it where at, at the place where deer would encounter it. Um, another good idea, if you wanna learn more about what the potential is in your forest, is to also put up a deer exposure and monitor, measure and monitor some seedlings within that deer exposure. Um, ideally, you would me measure and monitor 25 to 30 inside the exposure as well as outside. Um, but uh, it doesn't have to be a big exposure. It doesn't have to be expensive or yeah, or that big. Um, some that have been pretty successful is just you know taking some deer netting, uh, the plastic netting, and attaching it to a few trees and making a small plot uh, because deer are very unlikely to try to get into a very small area if they have vegetation all around. Um, so uh, you can do it fairly inexpensively. But what that um, tells you is, you know, what could I expect to get without um, the, the effects of deer versus what am I getting? So for uh, collecting data, I mentioned that we have data sheets. Uh, so this is a picture of a plot data sheet. And, you know, you just write the plot number. So you put one plot in, it's number, number one, the date, the recorder name, you take a GPS location. Um, so GPS is very important to have. Um, if you, we also have a phone app and uh, with that, it collects a GPS location automatically. So you don't have to worry about it. And then uh, you can see on the right there, ground and shrub cover, the percent 
of ground and shrub cover, sub canopy cover, canopy closure. Um, we record those because the more vegetation there is uh, hanging over a plot, the less sunshine it's receiving. And so the slower the growth rate you would expect from the seedling. So it kind of helps to inform whatever results you're, you're getting uh, for analysis later. And then we have the seedling height data down below. So what species are you measuring? Uh, the tag number, the quadrant that it's found in, and then the initial height. And then that's the hardest part is setting up the plots and taking the initial tag, doing the tagging and taking the initial measurements. And then each year after that, you just go back once and you remeasure the seedlings and that's all there is to it in the subsequent visits. So um, that initial year, the initial setup takes the most time. After that, it's really pretty simple. If you use paper data sheets, then you uh, can go into the website, avidir.com. Um, you register there and then you can enter your data on the website and it becomes part of the overall database. Uh, there are some nice features there where you can graph your results and it can, it'll show you a graph of your results um, year to year. So you can see if your seedlings are growing, it's a nice visual. This is um, a picture of what it looks like if you get the Avid app. So it's available in the Google Play Store and also the Apple Store. And so the Avid app, you just take your phone out with you and you enter the data as you collect it. Um, the one drawback to the app is that if you don't have um, a signal available, uh, it won't upload to the database, the main database that you know, the website is part of until you get to a place where you do have a signal. So you have to reopen it at a place where you have the signal and then it'll upload it at that time. And so if you don't remember to do that, it won't upload it. But otherwise, it seems like the, the app is a very smooth way, um, pretty easy way, because one step instead of two um, to collect the data. And so here's just, you know, walking through it, the plot number, the percent ground and shrub cover, sub canopy cover, canopy cover. Is the plot enclosed or protected from deer? Yes or no, um, et cetera, et cetera. We do, there is a place to record basal area or um, I think average overstory tree diameter, but that's, those are not required. Everything else is required. Those are just like, if it's a forester and he's collecting, de he or she is de collecting detailed information, then you can, um, you can add that. All right, so how long uh, will we like you to collect data? Well, uh, once a year within two weeks of the initial date is ideal, but I have people all the time saying, I missed my two week window, what, you know, sh should I still collect? And yes, we still know what date you collected initially and what date you, you collected the other time. So it's still very valuable data. Uh, we say within two weeks because then that's pretty much one entire growing season that you've captured from the year before. Um, again, four measurements over time is uh, really good to see if, it, if there's a change taking place. If it's only two measurements, like two years, you know, one year apart, it's only going to give a very small picture of what's happening. And um, you can also share data collection responsibilities with others. So if you say you work for a land trust or something and you have multiple people who are out collecting data on different properties, but you want to be able to share it amongst all of you, you can, um, there's a place on the website where you can share the data um, so that everybody has access to it. All right, so you're monitoring and using AVID and deer impacts are substantial. So now what can you do? Uh, well, first you can um, manage the number of deer by reducing deer numbers when possible. And uh, preferably before, if you're gonna have a timber harvest, you wanna reduce the number of deer um, if at all possible before that timber harvest so that new seedlings have a chance to grow um, once the canopy is removed. Um, you can fence to exclude deer and even small exclosures can be beneficial, some really small, like a series of small clusters, anything to get some clumps of regeneration growing. And of course, if you have a very large property, that might be really difficult to do. Um, or you'd have to you know, spend many years doing series of little exposures, but it is one option that can work. Um, you can also leave a good amount of woody material or treetops on the forest floor uh, following a timber harvest to kind of help out with that. Or I even 
a, a, a dead tree or a tree that might be competing with another one to try to create these kind of piles of woody material. Um, we've done a, a very large long-term research project uh, looking at the effects of leaving um, a large amounts of wood on the forest floor following, um, following a harvest. And you can see in this picture, one of our interns, Ryan, he's by one of the, the piles of wood that were left behind. And you can kind of see the seedling height is short near Ryan and it gets taller as you go in. And basically it gets taller after at the length of a deer's neck. So basically the deer, as far as the deer could reach into that pile, the seedlings were pretty chopped down, but once the deer couldn't reach in anymore, then they, they were able to escape. Um, and then you can keep monitoring and submitting data uh, because your data combined with that of others um, is gonna help DEC to assess deer impacts to forests and, and they'd really like to use the, these data to make management decisions or to help inform them. So what does success look like? Success looks like seeing changes on the ground, wildflowers appear, they're taller, they flower more often. If you have an exclosure outside of the fenced area, it starts to look a little bit more like the inside. Although, as we saw from some of those research uh, papers, you know, sometimes that legacy effect can last for a very, very long time if your browsing impacts have been significant enough for long enough. Um, you might see that seedlings, especially those of species that are preferred by deer, are growing past the height where deer can reach. So that's success. If a seedling grows beyond five or six feet, that is, that's what we're looking for. And I just wanted to share that we had a, a we did publish a paper on AVID um, in the journal Forest Ecology, Forest Ecology and Management. Um, basically, it was a paper showing that the method works, that over three or four years, we were able to, we were measuring inside versus outside of exclosures so that we were able to see is AVID a sensitive enough method to detect the difference um, between um, areas, between heavy deer browsing and not, and deer browsing and not. And um, we did um, see a difference over three or four year period. And the difference is uh, there on the right in the red circle. So you can see for sugar maple, for example, it was 18.3% higher outside or inside the exposures than outside. Um, same thing, you know, at, at many of our sites, it was variable, you can see. So red oak, same thing. Most were, most all, of, actually all of them were taller um, inside the exposures than outside. Um, as detected by uh, by using AVID. So just to sum it up, uh, AVID is effective for detecting and documenting deer impacts. It's a sensitive and site-specific measurement that can provide valuable local information. Um, and as AVID becomes more available and there's enough data, then DEC will be able to use this to further inform decision-making. There are, I put this here to mostly to remind myself to mention that um, we have some partners in Minnesota who started using AVID and they developed some uh, videos, some YouTube videos on setting up plots and measuring seedlings that are can be useful. Um, and um, I put those up there mostly because then we just recorded some videos last fall and they're almost ready. So they will be up on our website, aviddeer.com. They should be up there by April, I would say at the very latest. So they will be available on how to set, how to choose a site, how to set up a plot, how to measure the seedlings, three short videos that you can refer to even in the field. And then I think we'll, we'll put together one last one, which is just kind of a visual walkthrough of using the app. All right, if you have any questions at any time, or you would like seedling tags, you can always reach out to me um, at my email, kls20 at cornell.edu. And um, as I said, I have a lot of seedling tags that I could share with you. Um, I wanna open it up for questions and yeah. uh, perhaps I'll start with a question. Okay. When you say management, um, you know, th this study, affects DC's management of deer. Does that mean that they would be um, giving out more deer tags or what is, what is that exactly, their management of deer? 
Yeah, so it would be it would mean that it would affect their population targets for a given wildlife management unit aggregate. So I don't know if you know, but a number of years ago, DEC went from the small wildlife management areas or units to aggregates that are kind of larger chunks. And so within those those larger wildlife management unit aggregates, um, the data would be help used to help inform which direction deer populations should be headed based on based on forest impacts. Should they be maybe kept the same, decreased, or increased? And um, so it would help to to inform those uh, the trajectories, I guess you would say. And so yes, the, the number of um, permits allocated, things like that. Are the um, DC foresters required to follow this for the areas that they're in control of? Do they have to go out and actually do this? No, they're not. And so actually, so it's DEC Bureau of Wildlife that started this. So it was a deer management group that was interested in knowing because they're the ones who have to set the set the the, the quotas and the, the targets. They're in charge of deer management. And they started this as a citizen science method. They wanted a citizen science method because they don't have the, the funds to hire somebody in-house. They just don't have the personnel to do it. Um, but the Bureau of Lands and Forests, which is you know the state forest lands, their personnel are, are showing some interest um, in uh, doing it on some of the state forest lands. So, and some, some DEC people, I don't know if you know, there's a, um, an effort, uh, the Young Forest Initiative to create early successional habitat for um, early successional wildlife species that are declining. And so some of those uh, biologists that are part of that program have put in plots to monitor in some of the areas that uh, that they're managing for early successional wildlife. So there, there hasn't been a lot to date um, of DEC plots being put in, but um, that may change soon. So if anybody wants to ask a question, um, unmute yourself, feel free to ask a question. Uh, just curious because I was there a few weeks ago uh, at Sapsucker Woods. I saw a very large deer enclosures. Wondering um, if you've been involved with any of those studies. Um, no, somebody mentioned to me. I mean, I've been out there too. I've seen the deer enclosures, but I don't. Um, and I think they are do doing some measurements of some sort, but I, I don't, nobody's been in touch with me about AVID. Um, okay. those, so I don't know. I don't know what method they're using. You did also mention that when the deer browse the preferred plants, the seedlings, you get tend to get more invasives that take over, which we all know is not a good thing. But you mentioned the uh, hay scented ferns, that that number went up. Is is that invasive or is it a good plant or a bad plant, I guess? Uh, um, well, I mean, it's a native plant. It's, uh, but it, because deer don't like it, uh, when they eat everything else and it, and it takes hold because it's, um, you know, it's a fern, it's not a fern that grows in small clusters, like Christmas fern, for example, that's not ever going to take over the entire forest floor because it just grows in small clusters. Um, instead, hay-scented fern and sometimes New York fern form these like very dense thickets, as you saw in some of those slides. I'm sure you've seen it in the forest when you walk. And, and when that happens, the rhizomes are the kind of root-like things on the ground. Um, it, it keeps the seeds from getting to the ground. And then even when the seeds get to the ground, it's a very thick, uh, it's very heavily shaded right above the seeds. So having a seedling actually grow, you know, it doesn't, it, it just doesn't allow for seedlings to grow after that. Um, so it, it's not invasive, but it, it becomes the, what they call competing vegetation. So it's an issue for, for diversity of, of plants growing because that's all there is. And it, it won't just go away on its own. It needs to be treated some way to get rid of it. And really the only effective method is, is herbicide treatments. And, um, you know, unless you have a small area and I read a paper 
that if you weed whack twice a year in May and August, you can, after several years, you can really start to, you know, see a decline. So, but, but that's only going to work if you have a small forested area. If you have a large forest, you're not going to have the time or the energy to be out there weed whacking the whole thing. Um, so, so it is an issue. It's, it's definitely an issue. Um, but it is, it's also a native plant. I know I, I went for a, a hike with some cousins of mine and we were in a forest in Northern Pennsylvania, which has, you know, a lot of evidence of a very lasting, long lasting legacy of deer overpopulation and over browsing. And it's beautiful. It's, you know, a big, you know, like large trees, a beautiful tree canopy and just a sea of ferns. And I was, we were walking along and I was kind of aghast because my cousin said, oh, isn't this beautiful? It's just like Fern Gully. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> so it it is right. you know, aesthetically pleasing, um, but it's it's very indicative of a, a forest that's kind of in trouble. Right, because you, 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 need, you need the hardwoods, you need the trees. Yeah. Um, and if they're not being allowed to grow, you look 50 years from now, it's a huge problem. And uh, impact, not only for, for building, but uh, I was just thinking of um, people that do maple syrup. Mm -hmm. I could, you know, I, I know our neighbor, he's a big um, guy with maple syrup. That, that's a huge impact. It's a, a huge industry in, in the Northeast. And they could be severely affected by this type of problem with the deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the future, the, the existing trees aren't going to last forever. Um, in the lower Hudson, Hudson Valley, in those counties, um, I, you know, I was there to put in some avid plots, and there were some places where I couldn't even find beach that wasn't browsed so low that I, I, I couldn't even, find, you know, beach was the only thing I could find to measure, and I could barely find enough to measure because it was so browsed, browsed so heavily. So, you know, in the absence of other things to eat, deer will still eat American beach. Um, and when I looked at that, those, that forest there, it's the beautiful, beautiful forest, beautiful, huge canopy trees. Um, and if, but if anything would happen to them right now, that tree canopy, if those trees were lost, there's absolutely nothing on the forest floor to replace them. Any thoughts on bringing back predators of deer? Um, well, there, there's a, um, I mean, first of all, we have some predators of deer. I mean, uh, coyotes will feed on deer, um, especially fawns, and black bears feed on deer. Um, there was especially just fawns, very, very new fawns for black bears because. Um, but uh, Pennsylvania has done some fawn mortality studies and they've done some um, at Fort Drum here in New York State too. Um, so there, there are some predators. I mean, we don't have wolves, but, um, you know, there's, you know, whether wolves will make it back here or you know, whether it's socially acceptable to have wolves living in a, in a state that now has a pretty dense population, you know, whether that would ever be compatible is, is something I know um, was looked at a number of years ago through some some survey work and everything across the state, I'd say decades ago. And they found it, it really wasn't socially, it, it wouldn't be very compatible, I guess, socially. So um, Yeah, you'd, ha you'd have to drastically change the coyote hunting laws in New York before you could introduce wolves because a couple of years ago, a wolf was killed uh, closer to Albany than where I am. And the hunter said he thought it was a coyote and there's no bag limit on coyotes. So to introduce mm -hmm. wolves, it's just not going to happen. But um, there is a, um, Larry, if you're interested, there is an interesting video called How Wolves Change Rivers. And it talks about the vegetation and the undergrowth and how uh, the erosion of the rivers was bad because of all the deer browsing. And once the wolves were reintroduced it 
kind of stabilized the population and vegetation was able to grow. Bunnies came back, foxes came back, birds came back, the vegetation, and it helped the health of the river. So, you know, there is some stuff out there, but yeah, New York, you know, New York's just not ready to have wolves back here. <laughs> other than hunting you know to to stop the deer population do you know if there's any big uh studies being done maybe in cornell with um like birth control type products that they drop or, or put out as bait mm -hmm. for deer they doing anything like that no, not not recently. Um, geez, there was work done probably again twenty years ago or something, looking at Cornell at surgical sterilization even uh, through the vet school. I mean, it's not really replicable in other communities. You don't, not every community has a world class veterinary school, but um, but there were a number of drawbacks, uh, and you know the issue with um, chemical sterilization with you know medical like actually dropping bait or something with something and it was um, I think it didn't last forever only a few years or something so it'd have to be redone and there were concerns about areas that were populated and um, you know people and pets and things coming into contact with it and it, it really wasn't effective even the surgical sterilization here was not effective at, at reducing the population so it was it's very expensive and it, it just um, it's really kind of fallen. You don't hear much about it anymore. So, um, you know, really targeted um, take of deer by, you know, hired, you know, marksmen to come in and shoot deer over bait um, in, you know, local areas and then donate that meat maybe to, um, to food banks. That's one method of maybe making some dent. But it's it's very it's a very very difficult situation. Even if if um, you know even in areas where they've tried giving out many many tags as an experiment, um, you know most hunters will only eat can only eat a couple deer a year, and not everybody has the time to be out uh, long enough to to be able to um, to take more than than one or two. So um, so it's. Uh, and we have fewer and fewer hunters, so it's 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 harder. It's a challenge for sure. Yeah, and I know with the uh, like you were saying, leave the the tops of the trees down so seedlings can grow where the deer can't get them. And we've seen that a little bit with some of the clear cut type logging or that the DEC has done, where they've left the big piles in order for birds to be able to go in there and for the, the different things to grow. And they're not far from some of our hiking areas. Uh, it's interesting to watch as the years go on, how things are growing up in those areas that they left those big massive piles for mm -hmm. things to grow. So, so it does, that does work, but you're not going to go clear cut all the, all the forests. I would hope not, you yeah, know? Yeah. And in, in the research that we did, we looked at, um, we had the loggers leave, like the, the picture that I show where the deer browsed like as far as its neck could reach in. Those were, that was a treatment that we had with really big piles, like basically three treetops spelled kind of crisscross. So it would be a, like a long and kind of tall pile. And then we had an intermediate treatment where they were smaller. So only the finer materials at the top of the tree were left, and then we had another treatment where everything was removed. Um, the stuff with the very fine wood at the top only, only lasted for maybe three years. And, and then the snow, the heavy weight of the snow really compressed it. So it, it, the structure didn't, uh, wasn't maintained for long enough to provide protection for the seedlings as long as they needed to be protected to get above the height where deer can reach. So the key to those piles is to have that enough big material that you don't block all of the sunlight reaching inside the pile, but that the structure of that pile will stay for you know a good five years. Try to you know give the seedlings as much time as possible before that that wood breaks down and isn't isn't providing that natural barrier any longer. 
Peg, I think a great example of what you just described is the Farsalia uh, management area where the tornado went through in the late 90s mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. the trees were toppled just like Christy was describing and the, the regrowth, regeneration is just amazing to me. Uh, you know where I mean. Thank where, you. Oh, yeah. Where, yeah. Where is that? Persalia Woods over in Shenango County. Um, so if you went, it's, is it map 23 or? Sounds about right. It's north north of Bowman Lake State Park. Oh, oh, I've been there. And so it's the FLT has a trail that goes right through that area. And like Larry said, the tornado blowdown devastated the area. And they, um, I know our hiking club went in along with the DEC and planted thousands of trees after the blowdown. Um, so you see some of that is regrowth because we've had hikes where Chris or Becky have been on the hikes with us and Chris actually points out like those are the trees we planted. And so it's, it is interesting to see you walk another mile or not even a mile and it's a completely different forest, completely different because it didn't have that blowdown. Mm -hmm. And it does allow different species of trees, birds, animals, the whole bit. Um, it is a good lesson, Larry. Larry's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. We we could probably get you the details exactly where where you could go in and hike it because it wouldn't be like a long, long hike, but we yeah. can pinpoint it for you. Um, it is a good lesson. Yes, I'd, I'd love to know where it is because um, I've gone to Bowman Lake a few times. So I have cousins who live in Oneonta. And so we meet there to hike together occasionally. Yeah, the blowdown area is is very cool. We we um, we try to maintain it as best we can because of uh, sections that now have all the briars that grow mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. So the trail maintainer has to keep briars out of the actual trail. Otherwise people can't walk through it. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, the biodiversity in that section is different than the rest. So it's mm -hmm. cool. So as hikers, we tend to educate ourselves on what we can do to help keep the environment healthy. You know, simple things from like leave no trace and uh, learning about learning about the trees and educating others. So that's why we like to do these programs. Mm -hmm. um, next month, our presentation in March is going to be on an invasive species. The um, we have a representative from Finger Lakes Prism doing a presentation, mostly on the the hemlock willy. I don't know how to say the the both name. Yeah. yeah, so she's going to be talking uh, mostly about that with the destruction that it's doing, but mm -hmm. any other type invasive species that we want to talk about because we we're seeing you know lantern flies not you know far from Pennsylvania line they're mm -hmm. they're making their way up and we've had the ash borer and uh, another we had another bug that was getting into a lean to that the DEC had to give us stuff to actually treat the lean to with to stop mm -hmm. it from eating our lean to. Oh geez. So that was uh what was Perkins that? Pond. Perk uh I don't remember. I'm trying to remember. I asked somebody the uh the other day and they couldn't remember either. <laughs> it's like the I it's think a bug. It has, we went uh, to the DEC. <laughs> Do you remember powder. Larry? Yeah is yeah. isn't the word powder in in its name? Yes. Yes. Some kind of powder over, bug or something. Oh, huh. It was over at Perkins Lean To. Again in, you know, Persalia, Persalia Woods area. So um but yeah, that um we'll have that presentation. Everybody on tonight was able to get hopefully your, your email. And if they want to set up a plot, they'll be able to get some tags from you, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. The if you don't have um, a lot of the computer technology, like you said, going out that website that you gave, are you able to print off 
more of the instructions and forms? Uh, yes, it's a good question. So the data sheets are on the website and there's also a manual that has all the instructions on how to set okay. up the plots and everything on there. There's also on that website, there's a link to a presentation very similar to this one. So you can kind of, um, you know, go to the end and get the basics about how to set things up. And then the, the videos, the how-to videos will be up there soon. Okay. Um, extremely informative. I appreciate your time uh, giving us this presentation. We did record it and we're going to put it up on our YouTube channel too.